And as I say, if those gravitational waves come from inflation at the Big Bang, this is CERN Geneva. If you've ever been to Geneva, you land at that airport, you look out, you see farmland. But under the farmland is the largest accelerator we've ever built, the Large Hadron Collider. It's 26 kilometers around. It goes uh, across us from Switzerland to France about uh, 26,000 times every second without a passport. <laughs> And, and, we, and in fact, it's, it's currently down, being improved. But when it turns on again next year, it's designed to look for these particles that, that uh, come from supersymmetry. We have built the largest devices that humans have ever built, the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century. If you're ever there, you feel like, like uh, Gulliver. These are humans back down here. This is one of the small detectors. It's called the compact muon sol solenoid. It's a really small detector. There's more metal in that detector than there is in the Eiffel Tower. This is one half of this detector. The other half is on the other side of this image. Each of them weighs 20,000 tons. They're not on rollers, but the magnetic field is strong enough when the detector turns on that if they weren't already put together, the magnetic field would bring them together. And we accelerate particles in a, in a superconducting environment 26 kilometers around to try and measure collisions that produce these new, we hope, will produce these new supersymmetric particles. This is a sister machine, a much larger device. A human is down there. Okay. And this is um, uh, the, other de the, the, uh, the other large detector. And if we have seen gravitational waves from inflation, then it is likely when the Large Hadron Collider turns on, both of these detectors will detect a whole new invisible world of particles, of supersymmetric particles, that were just products of our imagination, but maybe real. So there's this incredible connection between looking back in time and looking at the fundamental scales. If, we're, if we are really seeing the beginning of time, we are going to probe nature on scales that are unimaginably small and maybe get to the issue of the beginning of our universe itself. Because if inflation happened, it turns out it doesn't turn off so easily. So not only will we predict that large, th we'll see new particles of the Large Hadron Collider, we predict that in fact our universe formed when inflation ended. But it turns out most of space, if we're right, is still expanding. And now, somewhere else, so far away that we'll never be able to see it, another universe is forming because that region is leaving inflation. It's like ice crystals forming at different places. So if we can actually test that inflation happened. We know there are other universes. We will know that there are other universes. Universes we'll never be able to see directly, but we can be certain exist because we can test the physics that predicted them. Just like in 1900, we could be relatively certain that, at 1905 actually, that atoms existed, even though there was no hope of ever seeing them. And so people, I wrote my book, The Universe or Nothing, I talked about a multiverse, the possibility of many universes. And people say, well, my theological friends, of which I have none. No, um, <laughs> that's not true. They say, well, you and I, as I said, you probably heard me say in Melbourne, in the, the Atheist Convention, they say you invented the multiverse because you don't like God, which is true. But, but um, that's not why we invented it. We were driven to it. But they say it's just like religion. I mean, it's, you know, it's, how can you say, well, the difference is, we can test the ideas. And if this is true, we can argue that the multiverse really exists and that our universe is just one of many possible universes. And our, the galaxies we see in our universe have a particular characteristic, but in other universes they could be quite different. And the laws of physics that we now have may just be an accident in our universe because if they're any different, we wouldn't be here. And some people who are religious argue, well, that's fine-tuning, that's this is God. Everything was fine-tuned so we could be here. But that's exactly the wrong thinking. The point is it would be very fascinating to find ourselves living in a universe in which we couldn't live. That would really be worth an after dinner talk. Because it's just like cosmic natural selection. If it, we can only survive in, in, this uni in a universe with these laws, it's not too surprising that we evolved in this particular universe. Just like a bee wasn't designed to see the colors of flowers, but if it couldn't see the colors of flowers to know where to get nectar, it wouldn't survive natural selection. This is cosmic natural selection. So the last thing I want to point out is that if all of these ideas are true, I have talked about how miserable the future is. <laughs> but it's more miserable still, potentially. 
Because if these ideas are true and the scales are what I measure, it turns out that the Higgs field, which now permeates our universe and causes us to be able to exist, may be unstable. And one day, it may undergo a phase transition, and then everything we see will cease to exist. So as my late friend Christopher Hitchens used to say, when talking about something from nothing, as he said, why is there something rather than nothing? When I told him about this, he said, well, nothing is coming at us as fast as it can be. In fact, if you wait long enough, there'll be nothing again. So the answer to why is there something rather than nothing is just wait. There won't be for long. So that's the future. It is potentially more miserable than you can ever imagine. But the good news is, if the Higgs field is going to undergo a phase transition, you won't know what hit you. <laughs> the whole universe will disappear, and you won't even know what happened, because it'll happen at the speed of light anywhere. So drink up and be merry. <laughs> That's the end of this part.